This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 21, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three are these. First, the top 20% are long on talking about compromise, but ignore it when offered. Second, Charles Wolfer's series on the PFD in the Anchorage Daily News is an important read, but it doesn't prove the point he may intend. And third, the oil tax initiative is out for signature. Let's talk about that. And now, let's join Michael. The weekly top three is now ready to rock and roll. Uh, Brad's got three big topics that he believes every week we should be focusing in on. Today is no different. We get started uh, today with a discussion about uh, moralizing as you hit the door, which you wouldn't think, I guess, would be that big a deal, but uh, sometimes it is a little bit irritating. Brad, uh, good morning. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? Thank you. Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you for coming on board. So um, I I know the story, the piece that you're going to start off with here is this piece from uh, Becky Holtberg uh, basically saying, uh, you know, I'm leaving Alaska, but... I want you to know what I'm fighting for on the way out the door kind of thing. And um, I, I just, I, I did find that this, well, I found a little hypocrisy in the story. I'll just be honest with you on the way out the door. But I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you take a crack at it here. Well, Becky is someone who's been around Alaska for a long time. She was a commissioner during the Murkowski administration, if I recall correctly, or was active in the Murkowski administration. Uh, may have been a commissioner. She was active uh, with, she, she served on Governor Murkowski's staff. She was a commissioner during the Parnell administration. That's what it was. And uh, most recently has headed the uh, nursing home and, and hospital uh, association and been uh, a voice on, uh, on Medicaid uh, issues and, and, and medical health, health spending um, in general. She's on her way, ironically, she's on her way to Oregon to head up the, the same a trade association, generally the same trade association down in Oregon. Uh, but as she got, le- leaves the door or as she boards the plane, she decided to uh, give one more piece of advice uh, to Alaskans before she did. And basically it is uh, buck up, cut the PFD, and, uh, uh, and, and things will be better, that you have to make sacrifices and cutting the PFD uh, uh, is, is a nice to have but not a, a, a need to have. Uh, let's cut that. Let's get the budget back in order and make uh, a lot and spend on what we need to spend on. Got let government spend on what it needs to spend on, and make uh, make Alaska a better state. There, there's there's one huge irony about that. Oregon is an income tax state. Right. Right. <laughs> so she's moving down to a state that that connects people directly to their government by by having them pay income taxes. Um, and but as she's as she's leaving leaving the door, she doesn't suggest that for Alaska. She suggests that we do it by essentially taxing middle and lower income Alaska families um, through PFD cuts. But what I find really most disturbing about about both this piece and a piece that appears in this morning's paper from Larry Persily, sort of the latest uh, from the spokesman for the top 20 percent, is is all of this about. Well, we have to make sacrifices with the PFD, um, and and we have to you know get our house in order through making PFD cuts and allowing government uh, to have the money. Neither of them mention a major move. What I think is a major move by Senator Shelley Hughes uh, at the last uh, PFD task force committee meeting to do exactly that. Right. Uh, to 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 come start coming toward a middle ground 
by agreeing to move um, uh, agreeing to move from a statute from the current statutory PFD to something that frankly I think is closer to Hammond's original intent, uh, the POMV uh, 50, 50 50 POMV PFD uh, 50, splitting the the POMV draw 50 percent between a PFD and uh, uh, and and government. Uh, and that's a major move by Shelley. That's about four hundred and fifty million dollars average over the next ten years. Uh, uh, that that moves money to to the state. Neither Becky nor Larry personally in in today's piece uh, that talks about you know all the sacrifices we need to make and we need to come together and we need to each each side needs to make moves. Neither of those talk about Shelley's major move. Right. It's almost it's almost like they're ignoring it. So. We, we have we have someone who's been a, a PFD defender, continues to be a PFD defender, making a move to try to find you know that middle ground, uh, and and the top twenty percent just keeps saying, oh well, we need to make more sacrifices, <laughs> right? Uh, fa- failing to acknowledge uh, what I think is a hugely significant step on Shelley's part, right? Well, we had Shelley on the program last week to talk about this specifically because there was a lot of brouhaha when she came out and said, well, <clears throat> I think we need to at least talk about this. And she came on and said, look, she goes, I floated the idea. They kept saying that they wanted compromise. They kept saying that they wanted, you know, somewhere, somebody to meet in the middle. And she said, so I floated this out there and not one person has come forward to really talk about it on her end. She goes, are they really serious about compromising? Because it is a compromise. I mean, it goes from the full, the goalposts are full statutory PFD on one side and on the other side is basically government takes 75% of everything and you're left you're hit with a leftover dividend of 6 or 900 dollars or whatever it is and she reached into the middle and said look let's have this compromise more of Hammond's vision you know the same th- arguments that you just made let's have this discussion and she said nobody's nobody's really picking up the ball and running with it so it's like do, were they really serious or is this just all this whole talk of compromise and everything just smoke and mirrors to protect Again, the top twenty percent income earners. Yeah, and, and I and I think Becky's uh, Becky's article, and I think Persley's uh, 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 commentary today gives us the answer. They're not really serious about it, uh, or at least they aren't really serious about it yet. To not even acknowledge neither one, neither one of those pieces even acknowledge uh, Shelley's step, and this is a major step. I mean, four hundred fifty million dollars. Is, is nothing to sneeze at uh, uh, in terms of in terms of his contribution to the to the fiscal so- solution over the next ten years. Um, that's nothing to sneeze at, and neither one even take the time, even even spend a sentence uh, acknowledging that that here we have a sitting senator uh, who has who has made that proposal. I, I, it, it is it is it is hypocritical i mean becky's piece is hypocritical as i say on a no- number of levels she's leaving uh and yet she wants to give alaskans advice she's going to oregon where they have an income tax um uh, and yet she's suggesting that th- she's not suggesting that for alaska uh but but i think the most hypocritical thing about both her piece and larry's piece is the failure to acknowledge uh shelley's a uh, significant uh, 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 movement and significant offer to try to, to try to get to the middle. I mean, they just keep going on about, well, we've all got to give something. We've all, well, Shelley has proposed giving something. Right. Um, and, and now it's, now it's frankly the top 20%'s turn to come to the table, uh, and say, okay, we, we need to make, we, we need to meet that and we need to, we need to start focusing in. Uh, it's just almost like Shelley didn't, didn't do anything. And it's a, I mean, Mike shower has said the same things. I, he said the same things going back to the last session. He said all everything ought to be on the table. I'm willing, said Shower, to 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 look at things like a, a POMV 5050, um, and and you have senators who are who are staunch PFD defenders, s- signaling more than signaling, saying they're willing to make a move to try to resolve this, uh, but nothing's coming back from the other side, and I and I think that's. It, it's hypocritical. It's disappointing. It, it undermines it undermines their claims, both Becky's claim and Persley's claim, to to try to that, that they're trying to move to the middle. That that they think Alaska ought to move to the middle, when they eat when they fail even to acknowledge uh, uh, Shelley's step um, uh, in that in that regard. Uh, it's just I mean it, it it it's undermining their their claim that they're trying to move to the middle. 
Well, and I think another thing that's just insulting, I mean, the Becky Holtberg article, she she takes a crack at this. And, I, and I've heard this before in the past. I think Priscilla said something similar to this, but I'm just going to throw this out there. She goes, take, for example, the dividend. What used to be an amazing gift, the bounty left over after we had addressed our responsibilities, has become a right worth asserting at the cost of a functioning society. Um, which I think is a fundamental misunderstanding, first of all, of what the dividend is. It was never a gift. It was Alaskan's fair share, as Hammond talked about, of the resource wealth because he saw government squandering a lot of that wealth. And, and uh, I mean, this is just kind of that same narrative that seems to have been, been pushed by the anti-PFD crowd forever, that this is a gift, that this is the same thing that Pete Kelly said as president of the Senate, that this is a, a welfare check. This is just a gimme. This has nothing to do with your rights as a as a stakeholder in Alaska's uh, you know resources. This is just what's left over. And now you're and now you're just greedy because you want to crash the functioning society. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's certainly the top 20 percent mindset that they don't want to pay taxes. They don't want to. Uh, they don't want to contribute uh, uh, any of their uh, uh, inheritance, if you will, in the case of Natasha. Uh, they don't want to. They don't. They don't want any of that of their money uh, put at stake. But they're more than willing to allow uh, the inheritance and the endowment and the and the the trust fund, if you will, income that's going to middle and lower income Alaskans. They're more than willing to allow that to be to be taxed and cut. Uh, and and reduced it, it's just a it, there's just a grand hypocrisy going in here uh, going on here and a, and a and a grand sort of revisionist history uh, uh, of of what the PFD was intended to do I as I've as I've said before I have the advantage or the disadvantage one of the two of having spent a lot of time in the lower 48 oil and gas industry and their uh, royalties going to landowners uh, royalty off off mineral income going to landowners is is that's the rule that's the American rule that frankly is what distinguishes the American oil and gas system from the international oil and gas system. We pay our landowners a share uh, of of the oil and gas revenues. It goes into the private sector. It goes into their hands, uh, and it has you know, significant um, uh, impacts in those states. Of having that that money and in, in go directly into the into the private sector, we've seen the problems with the international system where the money goes to government uh, and the squandering of that money or the diversion of that money to special interest or to, or to special groups uh, uh, through government's hands, essentially allowing, in the case of Alaska, 60 people, uh, the legislature. Uh, to, to decide where that money goes. We've seen the, the downside of, of that. The American system is, has operated much better. And, and, and I have the advantage, or as I say, disadvantage, of having seen that and seen the success of that system and seen the, 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 the benefits of that system. Uh, and to me, the, the Alaska system, what Hammond set up was a genius uh, creation of that system in, in Alaska. Originally, under the Statehood Act, we were set up to be part of the, to follow the international system, but through the permanent fund dividend, Hammonds created an oil royalty check that goes to the goes to the land goes to landowners to Alaska residents, um, and and I think it's that that's a that's a genius ability to to do to mimic what's going on in the lower 48 in terms of injecting a portion of the resource wealth uh, into the private sector, uh, and and you know when you go down the list with Pete Kelly and 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 John Coghill, um, and Becky, uh, and Larry, uh, none of those really have had any experience in the lower 48 in the American oil and gas system. It's always been, it's always been up here, uh, and it's always been focused on, on essentially a very government central, centralized uh, economy. And, and they're just sort of continuing in that mindset. It's like, well, you know, we got we, government's there for a reason. We need to fund government. Let 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 government make the decision of how to spend the money, um, and and they're they're ignoring the benefits uh, of the American system that uh, that I've seen firsthand uh, uh, throughout the large part of my career. What's your main takeaway here, other than the fact that they've totally ignored any possibility of a, you know reaching out in the middle as Shelley Hughes has done? What's your main takeaway here in the next minute and a half here on on where we're going? Well, I, I think I think both Becky and and Larry is, is, right now are signaling that 
they're not interested in compromise, to be very honest. Um, if, if there was a real uh, uh, interest on the part of the top 20% to compromise, um, I think there would have been at least an acknowledgement of Shelley's uh, statement uh, and and some evaluation of whether that was the right approach and and how the top 20 percent uh, might meet uh, Shelley uh, in a in a move uh, toward the middle. Um, I think the fact that that not only did they uh, uh, ignore her, uh, uh, but but continue to talk about you know uh, th this need for compromise. I, I think it, 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 while ignoring her, I, I think that really means the top 20% is not interested in compromising at this point. Uh, they're just going to keep on shoving. Key. The, the, their word, their use of the word compromise is code for is code for the Natasha's leftover uh, PFD dividend. That's their that's their version of compromise, and they're going to continue to use that terminology as they continue to press that and ignore. Uh, uh, very good, very positive steps uh, from the PFD side to try to try to find an actual. Company. This is the thing that kills me, Brad. Um, I mean, I was part of that whole pushback in '99 uh, on the dividend, and uh, you know, I was I was there for that that whole thing. And and I think this is what the politicians are afraid of. They know if they put this in front of the vote, if they put this to a vote in front of Alaskans, they understand that they would be <clears throat> they would be shot down. They would be eviscerated. Uh, I mean, the PFD Working Group put a put a uh, website together with all this explanation of everything, and they had a poll on there that said, you know, what do you support? They fully expected it would be a good split, and unfortunately for them, it was overwhelmingly uh, negative towards the changing of the PFD. People were just basically saying, give us the PFD and uh, and stop picking at it. And uh, and and I think that that is kind of a feeling of, the, of most Alaskans at this point, that the government needs to get their house in order and stop looking to the PFD to be the answer for everything. Yeah, they don't trust government. I mean, that, that, that that's the lesson of the Dunleavy election as well. They don't trust government. Uh, they, they don't tr trust government with their money. Uh, they don't trust government to the 60 people in the legislature to do a better job spending their money uh, than they can do uh, than they can do in their own lives. Um, and, 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 and that's, that's an overwhelming number. I mean, basically, it's the remaining 80 percent saying we don't trust government. We want we want our money. Uh, you don't want to give up any of your money, <laughs> uh, but you want us to give up our money. And we right. don't and we don't think that's we don't think that's the right approach. Right. And and it is, sometimes it strikes me that what's really going on is the legislature is captured by the lobbyists. The lobbyists have convinced them. Uh, and, and, you know, it, I'm not I'm not necessarily saying lobbyists are bad but and and lobbyists include community groups that you know want money spent on on community things um but the legislature is captured by the lobbyists who tell them how powerful how important they are if they just had this money they could change you know alaska society uh and 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 they just need the legislature just needs more money uh and alaska is going to be all better to you know spend it on medicaid to spend it on uh, K through 12 to spend it on the university. Um, if they if the legislature will just grab this money and and spend it in the way that the lobbyists want them to spend it, life will be better. And basically, Alaska citizens are saying no. <laughs> we we want the money ourselves. We have our own lives to live. Right. Uh, we'll decide what's better for us. Uh, thank you very much. And and we don't trust you guys to make the right decisions. Well, this has been historically the problem. I mean, government, we know better than you how to spend your money. We are better stewards than you of your money and what's going on. And I think that's I mean, that's that's been part of the problem the whole time is that this this is a very pervasive uh, attitude and opinion in politics. And you send somebody brand new down there and they, they're all full of uh, vim and vigor and like they're going to jump in there and change everything. And within a couple short years, they've come back with exactly the same attitude. It's it just it morphs them into something completely different. Yeah, it, and and they just have a lot of smoke blown at blown at them. It's it's uh it's both well in the old days at least both figuratively and literally maybe more figuratively <laughs> these days. But 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 I mean it's it's a lot of smoke about how powerful you are and and you can change Alaska society if we just spend this money if we just spend all this money on the university or if we just spend the, all this money on Medicaid you can change Alaska society. Um, and so let's let's get put that money in your hands. 
and you're the legislature's hands, so you can make those decisions as opposed to those foolish, uh, those foolish residents out there who really don't know how to spend spend their money right. or, or deal with their money. Paul makes it, it's a go ahead. It, 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 it's just a it's a it's a sad way to do things. Paul makes a valid point. He says, yet nobody is putting an ad campaign together to explain our side. They don't want to be taxed, so they send it to the lower and middle class. Send that out, and their popularity drops. And that's actually a message that you've been you know, harping on for quite a while now, that it is the, this is a protectionism for the top 20%, um, that it is the middle and lower income classes in Alaska that are being most affected by this. And yet it just it, it's not getting any traction. I think, you know, the mainstream media has got their finger on the pulse of what the, the, the politicians are saying, and they're not really hearing this other side of the story. And they're hearing, like you said, a lot of this revisionist history on where the history of the PFD came from. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, the, the top 20 percent has the money, so they spend the money. I've spent, what, probably two hundred thousand dollars over the past seven years in various ways trying to influence it. And uh uh, it's not, <laughs> it's it's not gained the traction I would hope it, I I would hope it would gain. I mean the media, the media buys off, the media goes to legislators for the story, right? Um, and and by and large, the story coming from legislators is we know best, uh, uh, we need the money, we'll make the decisions. Hold, uh, and the media hold, keeps going down that story. We just finished up with the uh, Becky Holberg, Larry Persilli opinion pieces. Now we're jumping into this four-part piece from Charles Wolferth uh, on the PFD itself. Brad, your take on that. Well, I for anybody who hasn't read it, it's a four-part piece in the Anchorage Daily News. For anybody who hasn't read it and is interested in the PFD issue, you really need to read it. It's a very well-written um, and, and, and a terrific history in terms of, of Alaska's fis- fiscal crises of the past and, and the role the PFDs played in that. Uh, and uh, in various uh, uh, various uh, issues and various sort of vignettes that, that, that come out of that. Charles, at the end uh, of the end of the fourth piece, um, uh, sort of moralizes like like Becky does and Larry does in his piece about how he doesn't think how he thinks the PFD has, is 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 should not uh, be sort of the be all and end all that 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 we ought to cut into the PFD in order to continue to fund government. It's more important to have all these government services than it is to have money uh, go out in the private sector in the, in the hands of, of individual Alaskans. But I, I sort of ignored that piece, frankly. I, I, think, that, I think the big takeaway from, from Wolfer's, Wolfer's series uh, that maybe he didn't intend was how government wastes money. <laughs> yeah, there, there's in in each of the in each of the pieces, he sort of goes through some of the history uh, about how the legislature treated the, the 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 having all this money in the past, and how they uh, uh, spent the money, and how they you know had battles inside the legislature for how the money was going to be spent, and who could spend the money better, and and uh, and and various power grabs for spending the money. Um, and that, and the theme that comes through to me is you give the money to government, the lobbyists will take over uh, and, and, and will blow smoke at how powerful the legislators are and, and talk the legislators into spending this money in various ways uh, uh, with, with all of the, all of the you know, uh, support coming from the lobbyists saying this is the right way to build Alaska. Right, uh, and, and you'll and you'll blow through the money, and I think, frankly, what to me, and maybe I, and and certainly I came at the at the series with a bias of sort of picking out things that that support my support my view, I suppose, but but to me, at the end, the lesson from this story was: you give government money, they're going to blow it. <laughs> You keep it in the hands of the people, and yes, maybe the people who support government government spending programs thinks that's bad, but it's in the hands of the people as opposed to in the hands of of sixty legislators. Uh, but but at least the people are spending it on what they think is important for themselves, uh, as opposed to you know giving it to the sixty down in Juneau who who are directing it directing it all over the place. It's a history, the history of the PD, PFD in 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 describing the history of the PFD. I think Charles did more to describe the history of how the legislature will, how, how if you give them the money, the legislature will will do bizarre things with it, uh, rather than the history of of why the PFD 
uh, is a bad thing. I think actually the, the, the series ends up being more pro PFD um, and getting that hands out of government or getting that money out of the hands of government than it does being uh, serving Charles's perhaps a particular purpose of of trying to justify cutting the PFD. Well, and we've even talked about this in regards to the ICER report and other reports that have talked about, you know, the money turning in the economy in the PFD, you know, doing better in the hands of private uh, citizens and private industry than in the hands of government. You know, you talk about the multiplication factor and the multiplier and things like that, and that's that's pretty well known, and yet it seems like there's just a cadre out there that believes that, no, the government has got to direct that money because the people – I mean, essentially, just can't be trusted. That's it's kind of the whole. That's kind of the whole thrust of their argument. It, it well, it, it, the people can't be trusted, but but the the theory is these common goods are better than the individual are better for citizens than than letting the citizens make individual decisions. Um, and and I might buy off on that. Hammond, in fact, said said some of the same things. Had some of the same themes going through the stuff he says. That government, in some instances, does do a better job. But here's the problem: funding it through through PFD cuts pushes the costs off on middle and lower income Alaskans. The top 20 percent doesn't have to pay anything. So they so they continue willy nilly supporting additional government uh, without having to make the judgment of whether it's worth the money, uh, taking money out of their private pockets, taking money out of their pockets to give give it to government, uh, to have government spend it. Cutting the PFD uh, uh, allows the top 20% to escape. And as a consequence of that, the top 20% is not engaged in putting constraints uh, on government when government wants to wants to spend the money in foolish ways or inefficient ways or in ways that the top 20 percent think they might be able to spend uh, their individual money uh, uh, better individually than 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 through government until we get all Alaskans including the top 20 percent uh, which is really you know a large part of the of the governance uh, in this state fall in the top 20 percent until we get all Alaskans including the top 20 percent having a personal stake in this decision making process we're we're going to continue to we're going to continue to go down very bad roads they're going to continue to give government to money or money to government and government's going to continue to make continue to make foolish decisions only once only until only if we engage the top 20% the 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 donor class and the and and by and large the top 20 the the legislature only if we engage the top 20% and make them pay the same thing that they're trying to push off on middle and lower income Alaskans, only then are we going to get good trade-offs uh, in, 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 in whether government can do something better or whether the private sector can do something better. Good luck getting the top 20% to pay the same thing that the lower class has been, because in some cases that's 20 to 28% in taxes. I don't think that anybody's all excited about that, but I see your point for sure. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Uh, he's the managing director for that organization. Brad, let's move on here to the big the big uh, cookie jar in the sky right now, which we always seem to reach into when we're having problems, and that, of course, is uh, oil taxation and the oil companies. Uh, there's yeah. a big initiative coming up. What are we, what are we doing? Yeah, that's actually going to be something that, that I, I suspect we will be talking about, about as Alaskans much more. Uh, this fall as the signature drive uh, gets underway for the initiative. The initiative has been cleared by the lieutenant governor now to um, uh, go out and get signatures. They need 20 some odd thousand signatures, uh, more than 20,000 sign- signatures to uh, by the beginning of the legislative session, essentially to get it on the ballot uh, next year uh, in the 2020 election cycle, which is what their goal is. And so I suspect we'll see a lot of advertising and a lot of uh, uh, people uh, Holding clipboards out in front of Fred Meyer and elsewhere, trying to get signatures on the uh, on the ballot. Here's here's the bottom line to me on this ballot initiative. I th- I think the I think the initiative uh, vastly overreaches and is sort of going to fall because it it it's trying to to do way the heck too much. Over the next ten years, we'll average uh, the projections are from Department of Revenue that we're going to average about five hundred million dollars. In production taxes uh, from the from the oil companies under under the current uh, current structure, the ballot initiative would triple that. 
they say that their ba- that the ballot initiative, the the, the sponsors, uh, would uh, raise about a billion dollars a year. So if it's a billion dollars added onto the five hundred million dollars, which it is, that triples the tax rate, uh, the production tax rate on the industry. I don't think when you when you look at people uh, uh, when people understand that that they're that anybody's going to think uh, that we can triple the tax rate the production tax rate on the industry without having an impact on investment um, uh, diverting us investment elsewhere um, and I think that's going to be problematic uh, for individuals if the if the those running the ballot initiative had said well we want to we want to raise some from the industry as part of this all-in contribution that Larry t- that personally talks about, um, and 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 targeted maybe 250 million dollars, then I think there might be a, a, a real a, a something to talk about. But but a proposal that triples the tax rate on the industry uh, over the next 10 years, I think is just a is just a, a non-starter. Uh, uh, Ken Alper, who was Governor Walker's um, tax division director. Um, uh, uh, in, during the Walker administration, had a presentation to the legislature in the last year of the Walker administration, which, ironically enough, was just last year, um, uh, and and talked about oil taxes. Uh, and he finished up with a slide that says, "Major and in quote, major oil and gas tax changes should be backed by substantial analysis and review, looking at both unique local factors." as well as global comparables. Oil and gas taxation should be based on fair share and related economic development issues, not budgetary need in any specific year. The, the proponents of the initiative uh, have, have offered nothing in terms of, quote, substantial analysis and review, uh, looking at both unique uh, local factors as well as global comparables uh, in terms of analyzing how tripling the tax rate on the industry would, would impact uh, would, would impact uh, oil company investment and, and development uh, on the North Slope. Um, and I think they're just, I, frankly, I think they're just reaching too far. This is an issue that should be taken up in the legislature, uh, but I think the initiative is just going down the wrong road. It's Brad, uh, I mean, I think we understand that there there is some money still left on the table, and you and I have bandied around numbers. You know, two, three, four hundred million dollars might be still in the realm of possibility, especially with some of these older fields where they're not pulling any uh, you know, that they're still not getting some of the royalty, uh, you know, on some of these older fields. But again, there is a balance point between putting, you know, putting it in there and then having uh, having the, essentially it breaking the bank as far as uh, as far as uh, investment in the future. Right. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, the, the issue, the issue that we should be talking about, when we talk about oil taxes uh, and it's been five years since we redid the last one. So we, it's it's time to look at it again. Uh, but the issue you should be talking about front and center is w- what tax rate can we have? What what take government take can we have without uh, without de- deflecting investment to other regions? What 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 can we do? What what's the optimum point that we can tax to without losing that investment? We overreached. I mean, we we know we can overreach. We overreached under ACES uh, uh, and and the level of investment relative to what was going on in the world. From the relative, the investment in Alaska relative to what was going on in the world from 2009 uh, to 2014 was horrible. I mean, we had a, we had Alaska's share of investment declined as a result of that. Uh, we saw production declines uh, on the horizon, significant production declines on the horizon because we weren't investing in 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 developing additional new oil supplies to replace those that were being depleted. Uh, we had that discussion in 2014 about what the optimum point was. We we reset S, we reset oil tax rates at SB 21, and as a as a consequence, we've seen renewed investment, and and with that, we've seen the 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 production curve go from go from a plunge uh, south to a relative flat uh, uh, production curve. We've had a gain of a significant amount by just holding the production curve uh, flat. Now it's probably it's time to assess that again. Have we are we at the optimum point in terms of, of what we're taxing? One of the one of the issues is we've had a federal tax tax change in the meantime. I mean the 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 take 
uh, that Hammond envisioned was always between state government, federal government through taxation, uh, income taxation, uh, and, uh, and, and the private sector, the, the oil companies, we've had a significant drop in the federal corporate income tax rate, which is, which has left, created some money out there that right now is going all entirely to the oil companies. Some of that should come back uh, to the state. Uh, but, but this initiative just way the heck overreaches that. I mean, thinking that you can triple income tax, tri triple production taxes uh, on the industry without any impact on investment is just foolish. And the fact that the, that the proponents haven't offered any analysis that even, that even shows directionally it might be right is, is telling that there is no analysis that would show that. So it's, we, we need to make some, we, we, there's likely room to make some adjustments. We need to be looking at the issue, but the initiative has just way overshot the mark. And frankly, it's just going to be a, a waste of time to go through the effort. They uh, have to get their 28,000, uh, <clears throat> have to get their 28,000 signatures by January 20th. Uh, otherwise it won't be on the ballot until 2022. Uh, any predictions you think they hit that? I mean, they've got to get 28,600 uh, votes, uh, excuse me, signatures to be able to get it up there, and they need to raise a bunch of money to do it. Uh, it's a pretty tall order for such a short period of time. Well, it won't. The, the money issue won't be that that difficult for them. Robin Brenna is backing the uh, uh, is, is backing the the initiative. Robin has had a very successful legal career suing the oil companies, as, as a matter of fact, um, and 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 likely uh, will be a deep pocket uh, behind the effort. I think Alaskans just need to think about uh, what. What what they would be supporting by signing that that petition, and they would be supporting the petition says we want to triple oil taxes. Uh, I think Alaskans need to think deeply about that. I think they do need to press their legislators to consider it in the legislature and to have some analysis done, a continuing analysis done of of what the optimum tax rate is without without deflecting investment. Uh, but I think signing the petition is really uh, just just uh, overreaching and 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 we're going to continue to have that discussion as the as the initiative sponsors uh, push for those signatures uh, over the fall well and it's always problematic to do taxation by ballot measure anyway because again it doesn't always take into effect the ramifications of what's going on it's <clears throat> very much a populist movement um, and uh, and I think it, it is one of the downsides to the initiative process uh, because you could put things on there that you don't necessarily understand the unintended consequences of, and I think that is um, I think that's problematic in the long run. So yeah, um, I, I, but I do think I mean to, to the extent it highlights the issue and forces the legislature to deal with it, that's that's a good thing. Yes, forces the legislature to discuss it. That's a good thing. It's just this particular initiative. Uh, just goes way overboard. And I, and I think that's the important part. There is still money on the table. We still could revisit this, but do we need to triple it? Um, I think that anybody, you know, who, who can do some, some arithmetic could realize that that would stifle uh, innovation and investment in the, uh, in the future of the state. And I think that, that would be problematic. Uh, about a minute here, Brad, any final thoughts here as we wrap things up? What do we need to be watching? What do we need to be looking at? Well, I'm not going to let the top 20% off the hook. Um, they they need to come to the table. Uh, Shelley has made the, the the PFD side has made a significant step. The top twenty percent needs to come to the table, and 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 I don't want to hear, frankly, any more from Becky Holtberg or Larry Persley or anybody else about how we all need to compromise uh, without some acknowledgement uh, without some acknowledgement of what Shelley's done and some response to that. It 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 is hypocrisy in the extreme. For them to continue to talk about uh, the need to compromise without acknowledging and without responding to uh, an effort by the PFD side to compromise. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. My friend, thank you. As always, insightful stuff. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.